Okay. I'm sick of talking about trusses. Let's talk about something else. What do you think? Let's talk about uh, beams. Let's talk about shear and moment diagrams. Okay. Uh, a couple of announcements. You're going to get a 5.1 today. Um, it's a relatively short assignment. Um, there's two problems. One of them is worth more than the other simply because for the first problem, you have to compute the reactions. For problem two, you do not. So it's less work. So um, what I want to do today is I want to begin our uh, discussion of beams and frames, okay? And uh, the main difference between, fr from a behavioral perspective, trusses are, are easy from a mechanics perspective. In other words, the only thing that the bar sees is axial load. So it either sees tension or compression, and that's it, okay? Beams are a little different. Not only do they see, at a minimum, two types of force effects, they see shears and moments, um, but those shears and moments are variable along the member, right? With trusses, you have a member, or you have a truss, you put the loads on the joints and you analyze it, and you get that member, uh, uh, member DH is 56 kips in compression, that, that force, is the same along the entirety of the member. But that's not the case with shears and moments, um, particularly uh, in, in the civil engineering structures that we talk about. So understanding the mechanics of bending, understanding shears and moments is an incredibly important aspect in structural engineering. Just about every structure that we build as engineers has something in it that's being bent, right? Even your analysis project, right? While we're not focusing on it on the analysis project, you have a truss here and a truss here. What connects those trusses? Floor beams that are being bent, okay? Just about every structure has uh, something that's being bent in it. So what we're going to do is focus uh, the next couple of weeks on one of the most powerful tools used to assess flexural structures, beams and frames, and those are shear and moment diagrams. Now, I got here my little warning uh, sign here that there's going to be some calculus approaching. We're not going to use any calculus today. And to be honest, we won't use any calculus for a little while. But the ideas behind calculus will be kind of important uh, in understanding the graphical approach that we use to construct shear and moment diagrams. Now, if you had me for statics, we talked about shear and moment diagrams a little bit. We are really going to talk about them in here because we're going to really investigate, you know, concentrated moments, triangular loads, all sorts of stuff. And understanding that step is critical to the next step, which is computing deflection. So let's talk about shear and moment diagrams. Um, like I said, um, beams <laughs> are just everywhere in just about every civil engineering structure that you have. Um, and shear and moment diagrams are some of the most useful tools um, to, uh, to civil engineers. There are some tasks that when you graduate with a civil engineering degree that it is just expected that you kind of either know how to do or have at least been through. You know, like for example, how many of you are in 321 in materials? All right, like one of the things that you just kind of need to be able to do as a civil engineer is a mixed design. You know, you're going to do it in there if you haven't already started talking about it. Like it's something that you, you should know. How many fluids folks are in here? Have you started talking about Bernoulli's equation? You... You will, you will. It's, it's just something seminal about civil engineering. Well, being able to construct a shear and moment diagram, it's just a, 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 a seminal skill in civil engineering. You need to understand it. Why? Because they are critical to design, okay? What a shear diagram is and what moment diagrams are, are graphical representations of the internal forces in a structure as you move along the span. So I have here just a, a basic image of a, uh, a beam here on the, uh, the top right. And this is way more complicated than anything we'll deal with today because there's distributed loads, there's concentrated loads, there's concentrated moments. And there's all sorts of stuff going on here. By the time that we're um, done with our shear and moment discussion, this will be kind of simple, okay? Um, but what I want to illustrate or what I want to focus on are the resulting shear and moment diagrams. What these shear uh, and moment diagrams tell you are the internal forces as you move along the span. And as a designer, they tell me a lot from a design perspective. For example, on the shear side, I know that I 
could design the entire beam for a maximum shear load of 46 kips, and if it could handle that load, then I know that the beam is fine from a shear perspective. Or maybe what I do is if it's an I-beam, maybe I design the whole beam for maybe a shear load of 34 kips, and where I know the beam can't handle it in between A and this 60 kip load, I place shear stiffeners on the beam. This is what the shear diagram tells me as an engineer. For example, on the moment diagram, it tells me that there's a maximum positive bending moment of 460 foot kips. This is where the beam smiles and the beam frowns at me across this uh, internal support with a negative bending moment of 100 foot kips, right? So if this is a bridge, let's say it's a composite bridge, you know, you have a steel beam and maybe a concrete deck. Um, over here across the pier, I have a frowny face situation going on. The beam is frowning across the pier. So I might be worried about the concrete cracking there uh, right here at this support, and that's the moment I need to worry about. There's a lot that this is telling me as a designer that's really critical to understand. All right, in terms of notation, one deviation I'm going to make from the book right now is the book tends to use the letter S for shear. I hate that because here's, you know, if you look at my S and my 5, I don't know about you, but I can't tell the difference, right? So I use the letter V for shear because V, uh, we tend to be talking about a change in vertical forces while well, I use V for shear. So whenever I use V, I'm talking about shear in this moment. Now, Instead of jumping forward right into uh, shear and moment diagram construction, I want to take it slow, okay? And I want to first talk about internal shears and moments, okay? And we're going to start by looking at the internal shears and moments at a particular point, okay? Um, one of the things that I, uh, that I wanted to do with this first lecture is I really want to emphasize the positive sign convention, okay? So here's a beam. Let's just connect it together. And I break out my secret weapon of structural engineering, the samurai sword or the lightsaber, And I, uh, uh, if I'm a sci-fi fan. And let's just pick a side. Uh, tell me which side you want me to look at, left or right? Left, okay. So here's the beam. There's my, uh, my beam, and I'm only focusing on the left side. What the positive sign convention tells me is that if I'm looking at the left component, positive shears are facing downward, and positive bending moments are rotating in this fashion, counterclockwise. Okay? This is kind of something that you just need to memorize. Um, there's nothing like magical about it being this way. This is just the sign convention that civil engineers typically adopt when we construct shear and moment diagrams. Um, the reason why that we, we utilize this sign convention will maybe become a little clearer as we start graphically constructing shear diagrams, but the long story short is that this um, sign convention makes it really easy to graphically construct shear diagrams, and in terms of moment diagrams, this shear, uh, sign convention tells us that when we have positive uh, moments, that means the beam is smiling. When we have negative moments, the beam is frowning. That'll become a little clearer later when we start constructing the, the diagrams and start looking at deflections, but I just kind of want to illustrate that for now. Um, so for now, I would say this is a memorization. But unlike trusses, um, where I guess it doesn't really matter what you assume when you're doing a method of joints analysis or a method of sections analysis because when it comes out negative, um, you just know that, oh, I assume tension and it's negative. That means it's compression that the context gets sort of taken care of in the end. Maintaining your sign convention here is very important to ensuring that the diagrams come out the way they, they, uh, they do. And that's important for a number of reasons. The physics of the problem making sure your deflections come out right. So it's, it's just much more critical, and that'll become clear again as we, uh, we go through this. Everybody good so far? Now, I want to start our discussion by looking at this example. Now, if you go back, way back into your notebook, this was the very first reactions problem that we did. Um, we had a beam, it had a series of point loads on it, and so we got 
a reaction of 35.8 kips on support A and 32.2 kips on support B. I think this was like reactions problem one that we did in class. Am I correct? I think, I think it was. If you've got your notebooks, you ought to look at it, uh, look into it. But yeah, this was like the very first problem that we did. And I'm happy to recompute the reactions if you'd like. Um, I'll say this about our discussion of beams. If you remember when we did trusses, I would kind of give you the reactions. I'm going to kind of do that as well for beams uh, and shear and moment diagrams. But I say kind of because there are some problems where I'm not going to give you the reactions because I do think it's kind of important for you to understand the start to finish process. For now, I don't think it really matters for uh, our, our goal of this particular example, but you'll see as we uh, uh, progress. Everybody good so far? So here's the beam. First off, let's just do the spot check on the reactions. 35.8 plus 32.2, that's what, uh, 70, right? Did I do that right? Is that? 68, 68. So 68 up, 20, 30, 50, 68 down. So at least it makes sense from a numbers perspective, from the verticals. And again, if you sum moments, you'll get the same thing. What I want to do is I want to compute the internal shear and moment at a particular point. Not everywhere, just at a particular point. And I picked a point 12 feet to the right of A. That's just the point I picked, okay? Um, <coughs> what we're going to do is break out the secret weapon of structural engineering, cut a section, and, and, and compute our internal shears and moments. That's the only point of this problem, okay? So it's very, very simple. Where did my mouse go? I think my mouse doesn't like me right now, but that's why I have my pen. Okay. So here's the problem, okay? And like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to cut a section Call it section 1-1, one, one, and this distance here is 12 feet. So if that's 12 feet, that makes that what, 6 feet? Make sense? That if this is 12 feet and that's 6, that makes that 6? Now, help me out. You think I should cut a section, look to the left or look to the right? Left. Does it matter? Really, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. We'll get the same answer, but to make our life easiest as analysts, cut a section and look towards the direction that has less stuff going on. So I'm going to cut a section and look to the left. Okay, so what I see is this 20 kip load. Here's the section cut. Hold on, let me see if I can get my scroll bar to show up. My mouse, I think, has officially died on me. There we go. That's better. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. Okay. So here we go. Let's see if we can put some dimensions on this. This dimension is six feet, and this is six feet. Okay. And pretty much this is everything that I need from my uh, structure for my free body diagram, except for the internal shears and moments. Again, I go back to that example that I discussed earlier uh, in the semester about me sitting on a table. If I'm sitting on this table right here, okay, uh, and Mr. Page breaks out either his samurai sword or lightsaber if he's a sci-fi fan, if I'm sitting on the table and he cuts through the table right here, what happens to me? I fall down. What happens to his grade, right? Okay, because What's happening is inside the table right here, there are internal forces that are keeping me in equilibrium. 
So we have to represent those forces on our free body diagram. And the idea is to determine what are those forces inside the beam that's keeping the structure in equilibrium, which is why I draw the shear and moment. And I draw them according to their positive sign convention. And once we have that, all we got to do is use equilibrium. So let's sum forces in the y direction, put everything going up, everything going down. So what do I have going up on this free body diagram? This reaction here, right? 35.8. And what do I have going down? 20 kips and V. There's an internal shear in this case, according to the positive sign convention, going down. So 35, let me move this over a little bit. Thirty-five point eight kips equals V plus twenty. Or V is what? Fifteen point eight kips? There you go. That's it. That's the internal shear. But that's not the only thing inside the beam. Inside the beam there are also internal bending moments. So we're going to sum moments. Now whenever we sum moments, we have to sum moments at a location. It doesn't matter where we're going to get the same answer, but in order to keep things simple, we're going to sum moments right here. Sum moments at the cut, where we're slicing through the cross section. So let's see what we get. When we sum moments at the cut, do we have to consider the 35.8? Yeah, so here's the cut, like that, exactly right. There's something else we don't have to consider, but you'll see that here in a second. So 35.8 times a moment arm of what? 12. Okay, what about the 20 kits? Do we consider that? Yes, moment arm of what? Which side, left or right? Right, so 20 kips times 6 feet. Do we have to consider the shear? No, it, I'm drawing it just to the left, but really what's going on is, you know, really that shear is like right here. And that moment is like right there. I just draw it off to the side because I don't want to bunch it up. But yeah, that's what's going on. So... We have just a bending moment, okay? So 35.8 times 12, what is that? Like I know this is M plus 120. What is this? 429.6. So therefore, M is... is that. And, hold on, hold on, positive 309.6. Did I get the right answer? Foot kips. We're starting slow here. Yes, sir. Question. Yes, sir. So I did it at point A, I just worked it out. Uh-huh. I got 309.6, but when I did the point A, you have to time the moment or the, no, you don't have to time the moment, like the, never mind. No, you don't. Exactly. That's a great point. That's a great question. So what, what he's asking is, instead of summing moments at the cut, he summed moments at A. So what you got is 20.6, you got 15.8 times 12, and then M. M is not multiplied by a moment arm because M is a moment. So if you sum moments at A, what is 20 times 6 plus 15.8 times 12? It's that. Again, the structure does not care where you sum moments. The structure does not care which direction that you look when you cut a section. The physics are the physics, right? 
Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a great question. That's I mean. I use a moment arm, so if I divided it by twelve, I got one. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it'd be you know that yeah, be be a little bit less. Is everybody okay with this? Now, I want you to do two things for me. First off, I want you to remember these two numbers. Because we're going to do this example again on Friday. We're going to do it a little differently because we're going to draw the shear and moment diagram. But So I want you to remember those numbers. Just keep them in the back of your head. Now, I want to ask you another question. All right, first off, does anybody have any questions about this? Very good. Okay. So what we did, let's go back to the problem. What we did is we cut a section at a particular point, 12 feet to the right, and we sum up shears and moments. I want to focus on what's going on in this little box right here. Would our answer be different if we changed the location where we cut a section? We cut a section right here. What if we cut a section right there? Would the answer, yes, the answer would change because if I cut a section here, like let's just, let's just do a thought experiment. If I cut a section right here, let's come up with a number. Let's say 20 feet. If I cut a section there, I cut a section and I look to the left. That's a different free body diagram, right? Different free body diagram means I'm going to get a different V value and a different M value, right? To put it in perspective, here I am sitting on the table, and the idea is instead of cutting here, you're cutting here or cutting here. You cut at a different location, you might get different internal forces, right? What we did just now was we did an analysis to try and determine the shears and moments at a particular location. But what if I did it at a bunch of locations? What if I did it at every foot? What if I did it at x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, x equals 4, x equals 5. Like almost a deli slicer, just cut the beam every, you know, every foot. I'd get a table of values, right? I could take that table of values and pop it into Microsoft Excel, and I would get a plot, right? You know what we call those plots? Shared moment diagrams. So the idea is, uh, it, you know, what we did now is we said, okay, um, let's determine internal shears and moments at a particular spot. What if we want internal shears and moments everywhere? That's a shear and moment diagram. Now, before we start talking specifically about those, I got a couple points I want to bring up, and some of these points might be relevant to your homework assignment. So, let's go back to this, okay? Um, when we started talking about reactions, you know, we didn't look at internal forces in the beams. All we cared about is computing what's the force here and the force here to keep the structure in equilibrium. So let's talk about this. When we did distributed loads, we said, okay, here's a distributed load over some length L, and it's W, two kips per foot, whatever. <laughs> so I can collapse that into a single point load that's at the centroid, and the magnitude is the area. What about this? Okay, triangular load. Collapse that into a single point load, right? Boom, WL over two. Where is it? L over three from the big end. With me so far? If you're okay with that, I want everybody to watch this because I got a somewhat animated slide because I think this is kind of important. Okay, let's take a look at this beam. Okay, this beam I have a distributed load and I have a point load. Okay, now this distributed load, what I did is I collapsed that into a single load right here, 20 kips and 40 kips. I actually think these reactions might be off, but it doesn't really matter. <coughs> now what I want to show you is this. Now watch this. Let's, have, let's say I cut a section right here. Okay? So I samurai sword or lightsaber through the, uh, through the beam. Let's cut a section and let's look to the left. So I cut a section and look to the left. I get something like this. Okay? I got a distributed load. I collapse that into a single point load. Is that 20? No, it's not. It's not 20 because 20 was 2 kips per foot over 10 feet. This is not 10 feet. This is six and a half feet. So how much is that load? 13. 13, and how far is it from A? Three and a quarter. Boom, right? So you've got to be very careful 
when you're cutting sections, that whenever you're looking at the free body diagram of the section, that the forces that you use are representative of the free body diagram, okay? I have been doing this for a long time. This is one of the biggest mistakes I've seen students make, is this right here. So, burn that into the back of your head, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So, now let's talk about what I was mentioning earlier. Our goal is to plot, all right, so, so what we did in the last example gave us shear and moment at a single location, and I want shears and moments at all locations, okay? So that means graphing shear and moments along the span, okay? So it would be a pain to take that last problem we just did and cut a section every foot. There's got to be a better way to do it. And the short answer is, yes, there is a better way, okay? Uh, what we're going to develop are some graphical approaches. Now, in order to develop those graphical approaches, we got to use a little bit of our noggins, and we got to break out a little bit of calculus, or at least some understanding of some calculus, okay? Um, relax. We're not going to be taking derivatives or integrals or whatnot for the types of problems we're looking at. We can avoid that, but the understanding of the relationship between uh, uh, derivatives and integrals really matters. Like, for example, what is the derivative of x squared? 2x. Okay, now let me ask it a little more generally. If you have the derivative of a second-order polynomial, if you have the derivative of a parabola, what are you going to get? A line, right? So there's a derivative integral relationship between lines and parabolas, right? That relationship is kind of important, and we're going to use that relationship. Even though we might not be taking derivatives, the ideas matter. Now, to illustrate what I'm talking about here, let's consider this beam, okay? So I've got a beam, and I put a coordinate system on here, and I've got a distributed load. Now, I've got it pointing upwards because I want the math to be easy, so I'm having it point upwards so that it's along the positive y-axis. And I'm just calling it some variable load, like W of X. It doesn't really matter what it is, okay? With me so far? Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, beam and I'm going to slice out a little itty bitty element. And I'm going to say that element's dxy. Y'all remember dx, like the infinitesimal element that's super, 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 super tiny? Remember that? Okay. So I'm, what I'm drawing here on the board is going to be replicated here on the slide, but let me give you kind of an idea. Let's take a look at that element, okay? So this is the element. Let's say it's dxy. Okay. So what do we got going on on this element? Okay. Well, first off, there's a load on the element, and it's pointing upwards. Now, the load is variable, right? It changes. Like the load is here is different than the load here and different than the load here. But remember, dx is... Super, super tiny, right? So I propose that over this super tiny element that we can say that the load is uniform enough that we can treat it as constant. So we'll call this load W, okay? Again, because it's super tiny. Now, what I'm interested in is understanding over this little element how much the shears change and how much the moments change. Now remember, I'm slicing this out. So it's like I'm cutting a section. And it's like I'm cutting a section. So let's take shears. What do positive shears look like? When you cut a section and look to the right, positive shears go up, positive shears go down. And I want to know how much the shear changes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this V, and I'm going to call this V plus some increment of shear. Like, I want to know how much it changes from one end to the other. With me so far? Same thing on the moment. I've got moment here, and I want to know how much the moment changes. Okay? So, just so you're aware, this is right here. So, there's nothing here that isn't here, here on, the, on the screen. But I wanted to show you that I didn't just you know, miracle this out of existence, that there's a reason why it's constructed the way it's constructed. Does this make sense? So again, here's the element dx wide. We're assuming a constant uh, load over the element. Again, even though the load is variable, we can assume it's constant over the element because it's so tiny. 
And what I've done for the, the increments is I said, whatever the shear here is, I've got a shear plus some change. Whatever the moment is over here, I've got the moment plus some change. What is going on with the equilibrium on this element? Okay. Well, let's treat this like we would any problem. Okay. I've got this W load, right? What can I do with the distributed load? I can collapse that into a single point load. What's the magnitude of that point load? WDX. And what's that distance right there? DX over 2. Does that make sense? With me so far? So, let's use some equilibrium to solve for this element. Let's do it here on the board, and then we'll replicate it here on the screen. So, let's sum forces in the y direction. So, what do I got going up? I got V going up. I've got WDX going up. What do I have going down? This right here. V plus DV. So V plus WDX is V plus DV. The Vs cancel. Or Does that make sense? And that's what I got right here. So nothing that's on the board here that isn't on the screen. So yeah, V going up, WDX going up, V plus DV going down, solve, and here's what we get. DV is WDX or rewriting it in derivative terms. So whatever the load is, if I take the derivative of the load, I get the shear, right? Or sorry, or sorry, uh, it, it, sorry, I said that backwards. Whatever the shear is, if I take the derivative of the shear, I get the load. Does that make sense? So let me ask you this. If I have the shear, I take the derivative of it, I get the load, but I'm trying to draw the shear diagram. I don't know what the shear is. I know what the load is. How would I determine the shear if I know what the load is? You integrate. Boom. See? This isn't so bad. All right. Let's sum moments. Okay. I'll do this over here. Uh, I'm lazy, so I'm going to sum moments about the right side of the element. I don't remember on the slide if I did the left or the right. Let's see what I do. Yep, I did the right. So let's do the right. So I'm summing moments about this side of the element. Do I need to consider V? V times what? DX? Right? I've got WDX times DX over 2, right? I've got an M over here. Do I need to deal with this? No. no. But I do need to deal, oh, I have to I do need to deal with that, right? With me so far? So what do I got over here on the left? I got M plus VDX plus W over 2 DX squared equals M plus DM. With me so far? Okay. Now, let me do a little bit of magic, okay? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel the M's, right? So VDX, I don't know if this, if this is covered by the computer, let me know. VDX plus W over 2 DX squared is DM. With me so far? Okay, now, let's go back to calculus. DX represents a really super tiny number. What happens when you take a really super tiny number and you square it? you get a really hyper, uber, small, teeny number, right? So the idea is that because I'm taking this dx term and squaring it, it is so tiny that we're going to take that to zero. 
And if we take that to zero, we get V dx equals M or, or sorry, DM or DM dx is V. And again, basically the same thing I got here. Relax, I'm not going to make you do that type of derivation on an exam or a homework or anything. I just want you to understand it. <clears throat> I promise you, when we break out calculus in here, it will be very little, and there will be a reason for it. There actually is an example that we're going to do later on where we draw the shear and moment diagram for a beam subjected to a triangular load. And while we aren't going to use calculus, it actually does help verify the answer because what we're going to need to do is develop a function for shear and a function for moment. And if you take the derivative of the moment function, you will get the shear function. So it's actually pretty cool how that works. Does this idea make sense? So here's the idea. Here's the idea. If, if I'm given some problem like this, and I want to draw the shear diagram and the moment diagram, the idea is, here's the problem. If I integrate that, I will get the shear. And if I take the shear diagram and integrate that, I will get the moment diagram. <coughs> Where it becomes valuable is when we look at the types of problems that we deal with as structural engineers, we don't really deal with a lot of beams that have loads on it that are like, the load on this beam is defined by the function 4 sine to the e to x or some, something like that. We don't deal with that. We're civil engineers. We deal with point loads, concentrated loads, etc. And so the nice thing about that is it makes the resulting integration pretty easy. For example, what is the area of this? What is the area of that? D DH, right? Did I need to break out calculus to do that? But I could, right? The theory says if I integrate the function H from 0 to whatever here, I, or sorry, from the, uh, the function D from 0 to wherever, I will get the area under the curve. But I don't need to do that because it's just a rectangle. Most of the shear diagrams that we're going to be dealing with are basic geometry. There's rectangles, triangles, you know, etc. So what we can do is we can utilize this calculus relationship to develop a graphical means of constructing shear and moment diagrams and it will be incredibly, incredibly easy. Okay? What I mean by that is this. Um, in order to uh, uh, really start to use this, I mean we're going to need a whole other lecture. We're going to go back to the problem you just did and actually draw the shear and moment diagram. But um, I would give you some advice, and it would be to brush up on some basics of stuff that will help you out. Here, here are some pieces of advice that to make sure that you're comfortable uh, with as we start to discuss shear and moment diagrams. First off, you need to understand the basics of plotting and graphing. And if there's something that I would really emphasize, I would emphasize making sure that you understand the difference between a positive slope and a negative slope. Pop quiz, is that a positive slope or a negative slope? Positive. Make sure that you understand that, right? When we have a beam, right, and the beam has a two kip per foot load acting downward, that is a negative load. So the slope of the shear diagram should go down, okay? Making sure that you recognize that is really important. Making sure you understand, you know, how parabolas work and, and, and stuff like that. You don't need to, like, write equations for parabolas, but basically just trying to understand the relationship. The other thing to understand is the derivative integral relationship of polynomials. And what I mean by that is if you have a cubic function and you take the derivative of that, you're going to get a quadratic function. If you take the derivative of that, you're going to get a line. If you take the derivative of that, you're going to get a constant function. What if you take the derivative of that? Zero, right? Likewise, on the other end, if you have a constant load and you integrate that, the shear diagram should be linear. If you integrate that, the moment diagram should be parabolic. I'm not saying you're going to be doing, you know, 
that, that first derivative test and second derivative test for concavity and stuff like that. I'm not saying you're doing that, but understanding those concepts are really going to make the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the graphical approach much more straightforward. Okay. Does this make sense? And we're going to handle shear and moment diagrams in here the same way that we handle reactions. We're going to take it slow. We're going to start with concentrated loads, just point loads, because that graphical approach is really easy. Then we're going to say, okay, what about a distributed load? Then what about triangular loads? Then what about concentrated moments? Then what about internal hinges? Then what about frames? where the shared moment diagrams go like this, you know. Um, is it harder? No, it's just taking it and doing that. What do you think? 1044. Any questions? You have six minutes of extra freedom from me. That's all I've got. I will see you next time. Oh, I need to use the right keyboard.